uh, just a word, take every word he says seriously because he's a father speaking to us. Amen. We welcome you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless and use you. Can you stand up please and welcome Bishop Joseph Mbafo. Please be seated. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'm, I'm glad to be here. Uh, thank you, Bishop Robinson and Elizabeth, for bringing me to the conference. I wanted to be there. I was excited to be there. I wanted to meet Benny Hinn, whom I've heard of for many years, and I was glad this time I could not only sit under his ministry, but talk with him. Of course, Francis Miles is, uh, we, we know him, he's been to Cameroon, and he'll be coming to Cameroon again this year. Um, I will not give my testimonies in the plural. <laughs> but I have many testimonies. Beginning from Bishop Nwaka's ministry last year. Then Francis Miles' ministry last December. Was it December? Yes. yes. On, the, on the winds. Uh, those, uh, I, I was transformed. And I always took that message, those messages back home. And lives are being transformed by those messages. Uh, so be it at the personal level or at the level of the church in Yaoundé and in Cameroon, I have many testimonies. For this last conference, many testimonies. I won't give you. <laughs> but there will, be a day, there will be a day when I will just give testimonies in my life, in my family, in the church of what the Lord has done. Uh, because of what you are doing to bless many lives, you will be blessed. You will be blessed a hundred, a thousand fold. Uh, if I, if I, you know, the, the conference was transmitted live back home over Hope World Television. That goes to 22 nations. So uh, our local television of the ministry goes to 22 nations. And the conference in its totality. Thank you, Pastor G, for the work you did, you and your team, uh, to connect with uh, Pastor Sam Masako uh, and to get that conference uh, to all those who wanted. Of course, it was late in the night, it was early in the morning, but there are those who followed up the conference. And I got WhatsApp messages saying thank you, saying that yeah, I followed up that message that yeah, I saw you. I said, No, you are not to see me, you are to listen to. <laughs> it's not enough seeing me in the conference. <laughs> um, I thank you for the work you are doing. You know that through your, your bishop, 10 missionaries are sponsored in Cameroon. Um, two of them in the southwest region, but the rest are in remote villages um, in the north in the north, semi-desert, remote villages. I will just show you a three-minute uh, video of uh, some of the churches where these missionaries are. Uh, the missionaries don't just, uh, don't just work in one village. They work in several villages. Desert, semi-desert zone. In this last week off, you'll see them clearer. So we we'll often start with churches of uh, this type of building while they labor to make their own bricks. Momo 
Kumo is another village. The village, the church in Momo is under a tree. They don't have even a shade. So they meet under a tree every Sunday. Uh, but we have land. We have land in Momo. They will put up a structure. They will not have to go through that, uh, that mat, that mat hut. So you are here in the United States, but that's the work you are doing in Africa and in the north of Cameroon. The poor heard him gladly. The poor heard the gospel gladly. Push Pus is about 2,000 kilometers from Yaoundé. It is our furthest church. It is the furthest church from Yaoundé, about 2,000 kilometers. Towards Lake Chad. The village is called Pus. Uh, and we have a missionary there, sponsored by you. That is him, the tall guy. Uh, in a village called Pus. Very, very far in the north. Uh, 2,000 kilometers. Muturua. Muturua is another town where uh, we have missionaries that cater for many villages, particularly in Muturua. Uh, they cater for churches in many villages. Uh, and they do it faithfully. The one preaching is Benjamin. It's called Benjamin. Actually, he supervises uh, <laughs> probably 12 churches. Benjamin. Uh, so this is the work you are doing with along with your with your bishop by sponsoring these missionaries. Of course, we don't just have ten missionaries. You are sponsoring ten, uh, but we have more than that. More than that, the two missionaries in the southwest. One is in Mutengene, and another one is. Uh, in some Bakosi village sponsored by you. Please continue. Stand with your bishop and Elizabeth so that uh, you can increase the number of missionaries. They are national missionaries for three years, no more. After three years, you must have developed a trade, a business that can support your family and you must have churches that can support you. So we don't sponsor them for more than three years. So that's who's, those who started last year, they have two more years. Uh, and we train them. We, have, we started a school, we call it CMFI School of Ministry, where they are trained for one month. All those, they come to school, they stay in one place, morning, afternoon, evening, they are fed and they are trained for 30 days. Uh, it's a very tough curriculum. Um, and they come from these villages as believers and as people already serving in church. To our great surprise and joy, some of them get converted in school. They were only religious. Uh, the sixth batch will start tomorrow. The sixth batch of the school that started last year. There's been no batch where people didn't get converted. During the teaching, he says, please, I want to give my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. It is now I'm understanding the gospel. Uh, uh, these villages are villages completely abandoned by our authorities. No schools. You know, you sponsor the school. The school is there. There are no schools. They are poorly educated. Their knowledge of the word is quite low. They are not, they are understanding capacity. So we need to keep giving them this training so that they can understand the scriptures. And when they understand the scriptures, they cling to it. So some of them come to school and get converted in the CMFI School of Ministry, um, which we hold regularly. One month course. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. 
Of course, I think CKC told you of our work in the Muslim world. He did. Yes. Uh, I came to the conference from India, from Bangalore. Someone talked about being a missionary in India. I would like to meet, meet him. Okay. Please, after the, after the meeting, I would like to meet you. Uh, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We, we have a church in Bangalore. Bangalore is in the south of India. Right there. If you saw me dozing at the conference, please be lenient because I came from Bangalore to Cameroon just to change the valises and the clothes and flew from Cameroon to this place. So the time zones quite confusing. Uh, we, we have a church of about 150 people in Bangalore. Uh, all of them are converts from Hinduism. That makes it something really great. Apart from Bruno, Chuansi, Cameroonian, African, married to an Indian, the whole church is Indian. Uh, and the ministry there was wonderful. The devil didn't want me to go because when we landed at the airport at Bangalore, the police took me at the door of the plane. They collected me there. I didn't know why. I, I believe they, it was mistaken identity. They were convinced they had a drug dealer in their hands. They were very, very convinced. They took me, questioned me, sometimes questioning me in uh, an Indian language. I said, I don't understand Indian. Took me to the supervisor, questioned me, Passed me to different scans. Finally, when I went to, when they took me to baggage claim, everybody had gone. I was, my valise was the only one going round and round. They examined the valise, tried to find out if it had a double wall, trying to. So I stopped and said, please, I know you're looking for drugs. You won't find any drugs. So they, they, were, they were surprised. I said, you didn't find any drugs. Uh, if I told them that, they would have put me back in the plane. <laughs> if I told them I was a pastor, they would put me back in the plane immediately. But they saw my Bible. They saw this Bible. They said, what is it? I said, it's a Bible. I'm a Christian. I had tea and coffee. They would shake. The... So they surely thought they got a drug <laughs> dealer, but... But what is sad is that when I told this to the brethren, they said Nigerians and Cameroonians are notorious for drugs in Bangalore. Uh, they said Nigerians and Cameroonians are notorious. So a Cameroon, I, I think I was the only Cameroonian in the plane. So they had to pick me out uh, and to give me that treatment. In the end, they apologized. I said, no, you are doing your job, but... <laughs> They were very sure they got the ban. <laughs> so, but it was a great ministry. Uh, you know, something which we did at the conference, crossing the bloodline, it is, it, is, it is so necessary. I taught on the triumphant life on the first day, and... I said, those who want prayer should stand up and come forward. Everybody, a long line of 100 people or so. <laughs> and we're praying for them. Pastor Chami Vensang came from Germany. So we're two of us, Vensang from Germany, Bruno on the spot. And we're praying for them. And they were falling left and right under the power of God. And at some moment, power left me. I was emptied. I had to lean on the person on, whose, who, 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 on whom we had laid hands. And I gave the microphone to Vincent. He continued praying. I was just accompanying the laying hands. Then power left him. He gave the microphone to Bruno. And we managed through. We managed through all that long line. But as they were as we're praying, the Lord told me, 
help these people to be freed from the curses of Hinduism that is still on the, over them. So I had to change all that I had prepared as the, the lessons. You prepare lessons and the Lord puts them aside. So I, I had to say, okay, how do I, how much do you know about curses? How do I teach on curses um, and help them be freed from curses left over from Hinduism? And the Spirit of God led me to teach on um, Lazarus, who came out of the grave. He came out of the grave. He was full of life, but he was bound, feet, hands, and the face bandaged. And I said, that's what, that's what curses are like. You are saved. You are born again. You have the life of Jesus in you, but you are bound. You are bound. You cannot walk fast. You cannot do anything. Your hands, what your hands, you lay hands on, doesn't, don't prosper. You don't see opportunities in life, in business. All, you, you can't see, you are bound. Opportunities just go by. And I was blessed. You could see that the, the people understood very clearly. That was the second day. So from the pulpit, we're just praying for them, making them confess their faith in Christ, confess that Jesus Christ has paid the price through his blood for their deliverance. And just in making those confessions, they were falling left and right. The third day, we said, okay, we'll now pray for families. We'll now set families free. Uh, so they were coming husband, wife, children, sometimes parents. And I give this, this case was much, most striking. A young couple with their first baby, about three months old, and the sister's mother. So there are four of them. And we're praying to separate them from the curses of Hinduism, the idolatry, the dedications and all that. And the lady started very violent demonic manifestation. So the baby was snatched out of her hands. And she was there on the floor as we were casting out the demons. The lady who took the baby ran to me and says, unconscious, unconscious, unconscious. The baby had gone unconscious. The connection between the mother and the daughter. I don't know why it's a daughter or a son. The whole matter of generational curses, generational bondages. I must confess to you, I was confused. There, this baby in front of me, the mother on the floor wanted to smash her head on, on, on concrete. I was going between the two. When this woman was liberated, the child came out of unconsciousness. I was looking around. Uh, and I told the brethren, unless you deal with the issues of our bloodline, you may have a church of people. Yes, they are born again, but they are under bondage. They are under bondage. The bloodline, it was a clear example. What was happening to the mother down there? The child was manifesting uh, the same thing. And the husband, the first day, was one of those who came under the power of God as we were making, as the whole church was making proclamations. He was one of those who fell in the course of it. Uh, that's what happened. As I, I will connect with my brother, will network. The, the need in our need in India is training, training of leaders, training of ministers who can set captives free. Yes, yeah, they can preach the gospel, they can lead people to Christ, but they need to go further, setting captives free. Brother Bruno's one of Brother Bruno's neighbor about three houses ago 
is an elderly woman who every morning took her two goats, cows, to tie them. No cow is a god. Take them to, to, <laughs> to eat uh, grass. When we're coming back late in the afternoon, she's taking her cattle, her two cows back. When you have people who have the cow as a god, the snake as a god, the monkey as a god, when people come from that background, it's not just enough. Yes, they've accepted Christ. They are born again. You have to set them free. I think it is true for the Indian. Of course, it is true for us in Africa. I'm a first generation believer. I'm a first generation believer. My father, of course, he got converted 13 years before his departure. Uh, but his grandfather, my grandfather and the rest were all idol worshippers, demon worshippers. When we come to Christ, we must be freed from the dedications they made. Yes, yes, yes. They dedicated their children and grandchildren. I don't know how it is with you. Many of you are 10 generation believers, so you must have been freed, but I don't think everyone. I don't think everyone. So that's, that's what happened in India uh, from where I came to the conference. Uh, but the power of God in the conference was so great, sleep, sleep could not overcome me. I think I would have been knocked off by sleep if it's not for the presence of God that was there. Uh, and I'm very, very glad I came. Well, the excitement now that I now have is that I'll be back home on Tuesday. That's what is exciting now. It's no longer America. <laughs> I'm going back home. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Uh, let me share. A, let, let me share something that could be connected to the conference, to the lessons from the conference. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. Yes, New King James Version. Now, thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. And through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. Let's read it together. Now, thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. And through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. Now. 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 Not tomorrow. Now. God leads us in triumph now. Now, thanks be to God who always, every word in that verse should be meditated upon, who always leads us in triumph in Christ. Now. Now means in that circumstance, in that situation in which you find yourself now. Now means in that challenge, not after that challenge. In that battle, not after that battle. Now, in that difficulty, not after it. Now, thanks be to God, in that challenge, in that battle, in that fight, I am thanking God. I'm thanking God because he always... What does always mean? Always means always. All the time. In all circumstances. In, at every moment. He will lead me. He leads me in triumph in Christ. Often that's not the... That is not, that's, that's not the mindset of many believers. That's not the mindset of many believers. So that I face every challenge with a strong sense of victory, Amen. a strong sense of assurance, because I know that now, now, um, he leads me in triumph. 
I don't know if you have the version of the Bible uh, called the message. If you have, that version says, he leads me in perpetual, in a perpetual victory parade. Wow. If, we could, if you have that version, he leads me always. He leads me in a perpetual victory parade. The life of a believer has been programmed to be a victory parade. A victory parade at all times, in all circumstances, in every place. Amen. 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 Do you believe it? Yes. Well, I know it's in the Bible and we believe everything in the Bible. But do you believe it? Amen. Do you believe it? That is where we have a problem. The life of a believer should be a perpetual victory parade. When it is when the sun is shining, when it is dark, when it is rainy, at all times, in all places, in all circumstances. And the triumphant life is not the absence of challenges. Brethren, get it. The triumphant life is not the absence of difficulties. It's not the absence of battles. We know that the believer's life is a life of wrestling. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. It does not say we may wrestle. We could wrestle. We wrestle. There's no Christian life without wrestling. Why? We live in a fallen world. We live in a world where principalities and powers, where there's a spiritual house of darkness. We live in a world... John says... The whole world lies in the power of the evil one. We live in that world. So there's wrestling going on. There's a battle going on. At home. In church. In the place of work. In your neighborhood. In the family. There's a battle going on. But we know it's not a battle against flesh and blood. That's where we miss our target. And we start shooting at each other. Are you shooting at someone? You've missed the target. If you are shooting at someone, you have missed the target. If you are shooting at your wife, you've missed the target. You will never win that war. <laughs> because that's not the target. Or your boss. Or your employee. No. Believers often miss the target. And therefore, they miss the triumph. They miss the victory. When you hit the wrong target, you'll never win the war. You'll never win the war. So we wrestle, not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against demonic forces. That is why the triumph is now and for always, because in Christ Jesus, that victory is guaranteed. Christ Jesus has triumphed over principalities and powers. Over principalities and powers. When we read Psalm 23 verse 4, um, David saying, Yea, though I go through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Ah, true? You will fear no evil. Yes, for David, for you are with me. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Yes, first of all, it's a valley. First of all, it's a valley. It's a low moment. It's a low moment. Hmm? A valley talks about a low moment. And not, not just any low moment. But it's a dark moment. A low and a dark moment. A valley of shadow of death. Death in my finances. It happens. Death in my business. You go, you go through that dark valley of death in your finances. In your business. What about your marriage? Does it happen? For me, it does. <laughs> 
valley of the shadow of death, death trying to install itself in the marriage, in the relationship with your wife, with your children. Well, if you have young children, that's fine. Play with them. If you have young adults and adolescents like me, God bless you. You, you do go through fights with them. Yes, those, the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil because victory is guaranteed in Christ. Victory is guaranteed in Christ. It does not say, though I dwell in the valley of the shadow of death. Brother, if you are dwelling in that valley, I command you to come out in Jesus' name. We don't dwell in the valley of the shadow of death. No, we don't stay there. We only go through it. And you can come out of it very quickly. The triumphant life is not the absence of shadows, of, the, of, of valleys. The triumphant life is not the absence of struggles. And it cannot be triumphant if we don't know battles. It cannot be, it cannot be triumphant. You cannot call it a triumphant life if there are no battles. If you have not triumphed. <laughs> that is true. But you know, there's this preaching that makes us think that uh, you come to Christ, everything is finished. Run away from the world. I had too many problems there. I had too many fights there. I come to Christ, no more fights. No. Those same fights will come along, but I have guarantee for victory. I have guarantee for victory. Now, thanks be to God who always leads me in triumph in Christ. In Christ. A while ago, the choir just sang a wonderful song. And I said, that's the, that's the message being put in song. He's faithful. His promises are sure. He takes me from one triumph to another. And I, and I think of this verse that, that uh, Dr. Miles used during the conference of 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 25. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 25. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. Was, was, was Apostle Paul's life a triumphant life? Very triumphant. But look at what he says. It was a triumphant life. It was a victorious life. He was a great man of God. But it was not the absence of trials. No. Beaten with rods, but living a triumphant life. He only went through that valley for a moment and he came out. Amen. Amen. Stoned three times, but living a triumphant life. Shipwrecked, but living a triumphant life. A night and a day in the deep. It shall be so with you in Jesus' name. The triumphant life is for you in the name of Jesus. No, it's not for your brother, it's not for your bishop, it's for you. Say, the triumphant life is for me also. Yeah, the triumphant life is for you also. Because you are in Christ. Because you are in Christ. Programmed for victory. Programmed for triumph. He always leads us. Always. All times. All circumstances. And an example I admire of that triumphant life is the life of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know the story? Yes, in Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. We'll, we'll, we'll go through the, the, the Daniel chapter 3. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These were youths. Are there any youths in the house? Yes, these were youths. They were on exile, taken away from home, we don't know where their parents were, separated from parents, and in another country under a mighty king called Nebuchadnezzar. 
Nebuchadnezzar reigned from India to the Mediterranean. He was such a powerful king. He was the God of the world. Taken by this man into exile. You, 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 you'll expect that these three boys are slaves, suffering, uh, I don't know what. But you know that there in Babylon, they were the rulers of the capital city of that great empire. Did you know that? It is written in the Bible. It is written there. Verse 12. There are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were on exile. They, they were captives. But they go to Babylon and they are in a victory parade. And they are living a triumphant life. How come? Jehovah. How come? They are God. This is in real life. They were not there suffering. They were not there, of course, to be taken captive, you suffer. To be snatched away from your parents, you suffer. To be taken away from Jerusalem, you suffer. But while in Babylon, they rose up to positions of authority, to positions of victory, to positions of power in a foreign land. I don't know how many Native Americans are here. All of you are on exile here in America. <laughs> I hope like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you rise up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. To be in charge of the affairs of Washington. Amen. To be in charge of the affairs of this land. And not just to subject yourself to exile. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. They were in charge. They were set over the affairs of the province of Babylon. That was the capital city. That's a good example, isn't it? Of a triumphant life of people whom you consider underprivileged. Of people you consider you should be you should be a slave. You should be slaves. You were captured, you were defeated in war. But King Number Katnezav, if you go back to verse one, set up an image of gold of such great height. Why was it an image of gold? Uh, why was it not an image of bronze? <laughs> and he wanted everybody to worship that image. And uh, for the whole world now, and more so for North America, that image of gold is calling for worship. That image of gold is calling for worship. And what is that worship? Working several jobs just to pay your bills. If you're here on Saturday, you know what Pastor Michelle said uh, on Friday. That's the worship of that idol of gold, that idol of money, of mammon, so that all of your time is taken. And after a great conference like this, we may not see the impact of it in your life. We may not see the impact of it in your life. Be very careful. Be very careful we don't waste such a mighty move of God as we had during that conference. I'm afraid it can be wasted. For some people, it will surely be wasted. Because after it, the trumpet will blow and everybody in Babylon must bow down to the image of gold. That's what happened. But these three young guys said, no way, will not bow down. Amen. Hallelujah. They refused to bow down to that image of gold. They didn't fear their lives. They didn't fear what would happen to them. They did not fear. I don't know if I have their boldness. I've not found myself in that type of situation. <laughs> but they were not afraid. 
the, the command was very clear. If you don't, the furnace of fire. If you don't, the furnace of fire. And Nebuchadnezzar's word was law. Am I right? You was the law, was the law. And they refused to bow down to that image. And Nebuchadnezzar was very shocked. Was very shocked. So, so bring those boys to me. Let, let, let me even see who they are, what they look like. And they came. And he says that, did I hear well that you will not bow down to my image of gold? What was their answer? And that's what I want to draw your attention to. The answer is in verse 16. Verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you about this matter. That was first of all very bold. It was first of all very bold to some teenagers speaking to the king of the world. We don't need to answer you whether we, what you have heard is true. We don't need to answer you. You heard rightly. We will not bow down. Old Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, that you will throw us into the furnace of fire, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us. That is where we are now, brother. Do you believe in a God who is able? Did that conference produce, establish a relationship between you and a God who is able? So that your commitment to him cannot be what it was the week before. So that your faith in him cannot be what it was the day before. My God is able. I, our God whom we serve. I hope that conference changed your service to the Almighty. I hope it did. For me, it changed my service to God. I'll go back. I'll go back with an, another commitment to serve him and not to relax. With another degree of service to the living God. I hope that conference produced that in you. That your service in this church will be different. Amen. Your service in this community will be different. Our God whom we serve is able. He's able to deliver us from the burning fiery, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us from your hands, O King. That knowledge, that knowledge that I'm not in the hands of, of of, of the American political system. I'm not in the hands of I don't know who. I'm in the hands of the living God. I'm in the hands of the living God and he's able to make me live in triumph in all circumstances and at all times. Valleys of the shadow of death may come my way. I'll pass through them. I may have to pass through the waters. I will go through them. He's able to deliver me. I will not fear and I will not weaken, I will not be weakened in my commitment. But they're going to say, verse 18, but if not, let it be known to you, O king. Hey, talking to a king. Let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. What a powerful confession. What a powerful testimony. I want to let you know that God honors such confessions. I want to know such commitment. God honors those commitments. God honors those commitments. He never fails. We sang it a while ago. He's faithful. He will never fail. This is a clear example. Amen. I believe the Holy Spirit wants to hear us say such things, confess such things, declare such things. And when we declare it, when we confess it, that's how the miracles 
multiply in our lives. That's how God intervenes more and more in our lives. And you know what King Nebuchadnezzar did? It says heat up the furnace seven times. It should be seven times hotter. Wow. I don't, I don't know how many degrees Fahrenheit or centigrade. And they did. Tied them up. And they were tied up. And they were pushed into the furnace. Those who were putting them in the furnace were consumed. Did you hear that? It's in the Bible. Those who were taking them into the furnace, they were consumed by the intensity of the heat. What happened to them? A victory parade. <laughs> A victory parade. They entered into the furnace with a sense of victory and triumph. Our God is able. Amen. Nebuchadnezzar stood there to see how his enemies would be consumed. But something happened. Verse 24. Verse 24, something happened. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was ast astonished and he rose in haste and spoke saying to the counselors, did we not cast three men bound in the midst of the fire? Did we not? <clears throat> they answered and said to him, True, O king. We put three men in there. Verse 25. Look, he answered. I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. <laughs> Brother, something happened. I repent that my spiritual eyes are not open wide enough. A pagan king, his spiritual eyes were open. He could see the son of God. He saw Jesus thousands of years before Jesus was born. It is, you should repent if your spiritual eyes are not open. Eh? It's, it's your problem. It's your problem if your spiritual eyes are not open. Nebuchadnezzar, a pagan king, his spirituals were open and he could see Jesus in that furnace. I should be seeing Jesus in my battles. Amen. You should be seeing Jesus in your battles. Amen. Amen. You should not be seeing the devil in your battles. <laughs> I think very often we see the devil in our battles. We see demons in our battles. Uh, we bind them just empty words because we are binding them and, and running backwards. He saw Jesus. He saw Jesus in the furnace. The fourth person. The fourth person in your battles. That person in your battles. He is there. He is there. It is his promise. Lo, I will be with you always. Lord Jesus, let me see you in this battle. Lord Jesus, let me see you in this challenge. Lord Jesus, let me see you by me during this interview. Yes, during this interview, Lord Jesus, you are there. Let me be assured of your presence. And let me see you. Even if it's, a, it's, 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 it's in the court. Lord, let me see you at the tribunal. Standing with me there. That fourth person, Jesus, is always there. But we don't see him. And we don't turn to him. Actually, we ignore him. Actually, he's there and we ignore him. And we ignore him and we go down to Egypt for help. We ignore him and we are crying for help left and right. Whereas he's right there. Because our spiritual eyes are closed. There's one thing I came out with from the convention. The need for spiritual eyes to be constantly open. Constantly open. To see the Lord. To see his angels sent to be with me. To go with me. To see in the spiritual. Because it changes everything, isn't it? 
it changes everything. When I see the Lord with me, when I know he sent his angels to accompany me, when I know he sent angels to take me through this valley. I don't know if you read uh, the biographies of many missionaries of the 18th, of the 19th century. Many of them talk about experiences. And I, I just give you one. One of the missionaries was going through a forest road to another station. And he was attacked. He was ambushed. But this is what the people are confessing after. But they could not approach him because there were people in white that surrounded them. That surrounded them. They didn't see the people in white, but they were there. They were there. And the people backed out. They ran away. Amen. It is real, brethren. The fourth person in the furnace, and he's like the Son of God. Someone saw Jesus thousands of years before Jesus came. King Nebuchadnezzar, a pagan king, an unbeliever. How much more you and I? It, it becomes a right I want to lay all on. A right, Lord, I want to see you. I want, I want visions of God. I want visions of the, of the supernatural. I want visions of angels accompanying me. And it changes the, the, the fight, isn't it? My life becomes a victory parade in every circumstance. In every circumstance. Thanks be to God who now, thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. That fourth person changes the nature of the battle. Amen. I saw, see four men loose. What happened to the chains? The fire consumed the chains. That fire is there just to purify you. That, that fire was never meant to consume you. To take away the drawers, to take away the chains, to burn the chains. They needed that fire to consume the chains. That's why the Lord will allow the valley of the shadow of death. That's why the Lord will allow you to go through the rivers. Paul was a day and a night in the deep. I wish he explained more so that I know what really happened down there. Uh, but something, some purification took place. He came out not the same in his knowledge of God. He came out not the same in his commitment to God. He came out transformed. Each of those battles transform us. Amen. God was leading them in a triumphant procession. They were enjoying victory inside the furnace. And the Bukadeza was trembling out there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Shall I continue? Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Um, so learning learning from this convention you know one of the things I learned from this convention and which I desire to practice is, 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 the, is the power of a transformed life the power of a transformed life and um, the benefit of the convention will be seen in the power we manifest because that convention transformed us or was supposed to transform us. Amen. It transformed us or it was supposed to transform us. If we take our Bibles to John chapter 3, you know, the Lord Jesus Christ, not John chapter 3, Acts chapter 3, the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified. Uh, we know all that happened to the disciples. Peter says, I go fishing, and he took 
some other disciples and <laughs> they abandoned the ministry in a way and went fishing. There are those who say, let's go back to the village, to Emmaus. <laughs> so this, thing, this thing is more than us. It's no longer there. And took them back to the village. But in Acts chapter 1, the Lord Jesus Christ promised the power of the Holy Spirit. He promised the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And in Acts chapter 2, they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. I hope everybody in this church is baptized in the Holy Spirit. If not, Robinson should repent. The bishop should repent. If anybody here is not baptized in the Holy Spirit. Uh, everybody is. Great. Praise the Lord. Congratulations, Bishop. <laughs> no, because, because um, it should not be long after conversion. Actually, when Elizabeth's father started this ministry, we had baptism in water every Saturday. And after baptism in water, we went straight for baptism to the Holy Spirit. We did not give one or two or one week more. And it was every Saturday. So those who were baptized before, the next Saturday, they are refilled. And the next Saturday, they are refilled. And uh, this ministry that started long after many other denominations had started, in a few years, was the largest in number and the most widespread in Cameroon. Actually, it's a CBN of Pat Robinson. They made that survey in Cameroon in 97. But it was the power of the Holy Spirit. It was the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes to transform us. And the power of a transformed life cannot be hidden. If your life is transformed, it cannot be hidden. It cannot just be hallelujah in the church. So in Acts chapter 3, Peter and John, you can go to verse 1, are going to the temple as usual in the hour of prayer. Verse 2. And a certain lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid down at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask for arms from those who enter the temple. That verse is significant. This man was lame from his mother's womb. And every day he was carried to church and placed there to beg. They say temple, I want to call it church. Place of worship. Every day. So I think he was there when the Lord Jesus Christ was alive. He was surely there when these apostles were alive. Born full of life, he had legs that could not carry him. Say legs that could not carry him. Say it. He had legs, but legs that could not carry him. That how some people are in church. I'm sorry. There are people in church like this man with legs that cannot carry them. So they have to be carried along. They have to be carried along all the time. He surely had parents that loved him so much. Every day carried to church and every day carry back from church. We are a very loving church. You carry people. Congratulations. But there are people who have legs that cannot carry them. They have the life of God in them. But somewhere they are handicapped. Somewhere, what could this man do? No matter the Bible knowledge he had, what could he do? Of what service could he be? Maybe, maybe he knew how to sing all the songs. He knew how to sing them. <laughs> but what could he, else could he do? Of what service could he be to another person? With legs that could not carry him. And in our churches, I'm not just talking about you. Maybe you, you're all definitely freed. But I visit many churches. And I see people with legs that cannot carry them. Then they are the, 
they are the door of the temple. Hmm? They are the gate called beautiful. I don't know how beautiful that gate was, but they were at a comfortable place in the church to receive ministry, to receive gifts, to receive the prayers of blessing, and it all ended there. And their lives were not changed. This man, for how long, I don't know, but his life was not changed until spirit-filled people came his way. Amen? Amen. They had just been baptized into the Holy Spirit. They had been clothed with power. And they meet, they come to this gate called Beautiful. That was not their first time of going to the temple to pray. And they perform the miracle. And this man is healed. Amen? Amen. And this man is healed. The power of a spirit-filled life. If you are spirit-filled, begin to transform one life in this church. Begin to transform one life in your family. Amen. Begin to transform one life in your place of work. That is what the baptism of the Holy Spirit should produce. Amen. He needed Peter and John filled with the Holy Spirit to go that way. And this man's life was transformed. What happened? Peter, they said, silver and gold we don't have, but in the name of Jesus Christ, stand up and walk. Verse 7, verse 8. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. Amen. Tell your neighbor, that conference equipped you to give strength to someone. The conference equipped me to give strength, to communicate strength to somebody. Yes. That conference equipped me to give strength to some other person in the church. They held him, they took him up, and his feet and ankles received strength. Verse 8. So he leaped up, stood up, and walked and entered the temple with them, walking and limping and praising God. Now he entered the temple before he stood at the gate. Now he was fully involved in the church before he was an onlooker. Don't be an onlooker. And if there's an onlooker here, you go and give him strength. Don't be an onlooker. But if you know an onlooker in this church, go and give him strength. Then he will no longer sit at the gate. He will enter. Hallelujah. He entered the temple. Walking, limping, praising God. Brother, are you standing at the gate? In the name of Jesus Christ, enter. Are you just standing there observing what these people are doing? I invite you in the name of Jesus Christ, enter. May the Lord give you strength. May your legs be strengthened. So that you're not that believer who is carried year after year. Month. No, you should be carried for a few weeks after conversion. You should be carried. But after that, you should receive strength. You should, be re you should receive strength. And this man's life was transformed. And I want you to see the power of a transformed life. He entered the temple, limping and praising God. And what happens? You can go now to chapter 4 from verse 1 to see the power of a transformed life. Go to chapter 4 verse 1. And as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. Verse 2 being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Verse 3. And they laid hands on them to put them in custody until the next day for it was already evening. Verse 4. However, many of those who heard the word believed and the number of men came up to about 5,000. That is the power of the transformation of this lame man. It brought in so many people to Christ. 
the power of a transformed life. It brought so many people to the faith. Look at the number of people at the convention, at the conference, plus those who are online. We left that conference, convent, that conference transformed. The impact of it. Take no rest. Give yourself no rest until the impact of your transformed life is visible in the life of another person. In the life of another person. Give yourself no rest. Take no rest until that life is transforming someone. Giving strength to his knees. Giving strength to his faith. Giving strength to his love for Jesus. No one has the right to be the same who followed online or who followed who were present you have no right to be the same that was not a conference that leaves anybody the same but it should not just end with you it should produce results it should produce results and the results we want to see is the impact it has on someone else. The impact it will have on someone else. Are we together? Yes. Tell yourself, say, my life will impact others. Yes, my life must impact others. And my life will impact others. That's the power of a transformed life. As the power of a transformed life. Have many of those conventions. Uh, will you invite me? <laughs> yes. No, they are transforming, please. It's not just an, an event. They are transforming. And you, you being transformed should impact others. One lame man. Of course, they knew him as lame from birth. But they now see what Jesus has done in his life. And 5,000 people says, we must join these people. We must join this church. We must join this movement. The power of a transformed life. God wants to do that for each one of us. He wants to do that for each one of us. Whether you say amen or not, that's what he wants to do. <laughs> that's what he wants to do. And he will do it in Jesus' name. He will do it in Jesus' name. That's his perfect will. Could we stand and I will plead that bishop and his wife should pray for us. For us. We're transformed. The Lord touched us at the convention. He did. He did. Um, he wants us to be to believe him, our God is able, so that we stand strong in every battle, so that we stand strong in every battle and refuse to worship the God Mammon. He visited us so that we will stand strong in every battle and impact the lives of many others, beginning from those in this church. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we bless you because you brought right perspective, direction to the transformation that we received during the conference, Lord. We just thank you, Spirit of the living God, because you have put fire upon what we received, oh God, and we say yes. We receive your word by faith. We receive your word with obedient hearts, with an intention to obey your word, Lord. We receive your word, oh God, and we declare oh god over each one of us listening those here and those online that our lives will not be the same as we have accepted that we have been transformed lord we choose to let our lives transform another person oh god we thank you for the triumphant life oh god the power of a triumphant life lord thank you for the victory parade we declare lord that we make it a permanent and a continuous victory parade for miracle center we declare lord that you oh god 
God. You are with us and we will serve no other God. We make this affirmation before you and before principalities and powers that we shall bow to no other God. We shall bow to no other God. We don't bow to money. We don't bow to the systems and the government of this world. Lord, we serve you and you alone. And Lord, in, 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 in accordance to your word, we choose from today to see you in the midst of our battles, Lord. The fourth man in the fire. Our eyes be opened right now. I declare eyes open. Our spiritual eyes open to see the Son of God who is walking with us. Because though I am with you always to the very end of the age. Lord, we take our eyes off the demonic powers and, and people and those who hate us and those who are against us. We take our eyes off them right now in the name of Jesus. And we set our eyes and affection upon you, Lord Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. We bless you, Lord, for this word that sets us free. In Jesus' name, amen. Just raise your hands and let's pray together. Say, Father, you visited us. You touched our lives. We pray for the grace to move according to your visitation. To live according to your visitation. We pray, Lord, that we will not lose the impact of this visitation. Father, we pray because you have blessed us you want to make us a blessing. We choose to go out and to minister as you have ministered to us. We thank you, Lord. We are going in the power of the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we renounce every bondage that holds us, that keeps us from serving you, from being the people you call. Because to whom much is given, much is required. As you have given much to us, Lord, we ask for the grace to give much to others as well. Therefore, in Jesus' name, from today, we say, Lord, we shall change the life of the people you bring our way. We, Lord, even when we meet the lame, the lame will walk. Even those whose legs cannot carry them, we shall carry them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Raise your hands and give God the glory. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord. We give you the praise. We thank you for what you have done. We thank you for what you are doing. We thank you because you are setting us apart and you are releasing us from all the bondages. And thank you because we are going in the power of the Holy Spirit. Let your name be praised in Jesus' name. Shout a shout of victory. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. You can sit down, please. Amen.